discovery meeting, we really heard from you. Um, many of you participated, and since it's after lunch, we can get kind of our, our limbs moving. By a show of hands, how many of you completed the survey or shared your experience, either video or virtually? Awesome. Well, thank you for doing that. In the survey, um, uh, we found that there's, there's one third of people who are living with IH who reported cost or other financial concerns as a barrier. And that was something that really stuck out to us and, and one of the reasons that we're here talking about this today. For people who are already on medication, about a quarter of them reported that cost or finances were a barrier to staying on treatment. And I remember one of the people who were sharing their experiences on video, there was concerns about being able to stay on their medication with job or insurance changes. Um, so we're here to really address that and help educate you about the process so you can better advocate your, for yourself. Uh, advocating can be really exhausting. Um, and hopefully the ladies today can share with us some of their tips from behind the scenes. So our goals, we're gonna hear from the experts um, and really understand the process. We're also gonna bust some myths. I know that there's a lot of conversations that are happening where people are communicating what's working for them, what hasn't worked for them and some of the challenges. Um, and we're gonna talk through some myths um, to help really like illuminate some of the challenges and provide some really practical tips for the group. So based on Kristen's experience, both working at Jazz and working with specialty pharmacies, as well as her experience in working with a specialist doctor's office, she has sort of both perspectives in mind of being able to like talk through what happens after a specialty medication is prescribed. But before we even go into that, Kristen, do you wanna tell us about what a specialty medication is? Yeah, so uh, specialty medications are, are typically require special handling or different levels of monitoring. And they're typically reserved for rare, complex, or chronic conditions. Um, with IH being rare, uh, it would not be unusual um, for you to have conversations with your provider about a medication that would be considered um, specialty. Um, so we thought that that would be good for to define because they are treated differently than, uh, say, a medication you would get at like a, a retail pharmacy down the street from your home. Yeah. So if a specialty medication can't be get, gotten at a retail pharmacy, where, where are they available from? Yeah. So they're called specialty pharmacies for the specialty medication. <laughs> it kind of goes hand in hand. So these uh, specialty pharmacies um, are shipped to you. They would ship to your home um, and Instead of you going to pick up, say, like I said, down the street at your nearby local pharmacy, um, these specialty pharmacies also offer different services um, for depending on what type of medication you may be prescribed. Um, and we'll talk a little bit more about that later. Um, and I think it's important to note as well, because that can sound like, oh, gosh, what's a specialty pharmacy? Like, where do I find one? Um, typically, um, depending on the medication and the health plan that you're on, health insurance, whatever we want to call it, um, that is predetermined. So after you um, get prescribed a medication, depending on your health plan, they'll already know which specialty pharmacy within your network that medication would come from. Got it. So there's fewer choices, but it sounds like there's a little bit more support available through the process. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think that uh, the there's support along the way um, with the specialty pharmacies. There's, you know, a lot of people there who can help pharmacists, nurse, um, the providers at the office. So um, there are there are resources available. Awesome, awesome. So Kristen, when you're when a doctor decides to write a prescription for a specialty medication. Um, and, the, and the person is in the office, what takes place at that point? Yeah, so um, hopefully you and your provider, you've gotten your questions answered um, and you've, you've had that discussion with them. Um, but often with these types of medications, there's some paperwork involved. Um, so a prescriber and or sometimes the patient has to also fill out some paperwork to get this process going. And I would say that paperwork is what initiates the process. And would it be correct in saying that sometimes the paperwork can slow down the process? And do you want to tell us a little bit about the reasons why? Yeah, absolutely. Um, paperwork are all number one favorite thing, right? So, <laughs> so um, yeah, if, if the paperwork is not complete thoroughly, um, meaning that everything's not filled out, if there's errors or someone didn't sign, say the provider forgot to sign, or even you as the patient forgot to sign, um, it can delay the process because that paperwork has to be fully completed before it can move on to the next step. 
Yeah. Yeah. And it sounds like there's a lot of information that is valuable to be on that form to start some of that insurance process. Do you want to talk a little bit about that? Yeah, sure. So um, often these these forms will have, you know, identifiers for yourself, such as name, date of birth, that type of thing. But it'll also include things such as the dosing that your provider wants or um, your diagnosis. So in the very, what that would include for that medication. Um, but also, um, this is where uh, you as the patient would be able to provide your office with up-to-date health insurance information, because that is also part of having all the adequate paperwork um, um, completed. Awesome. And once that form is completed, um, the specialty pharmacy goes through a process working with the insurance company. And I know there was like a question about insurance companies a little bit earlier today. Um, can you help us understand what happens between the specialty pharmacy and the insurance company? Yeah, absolutely. So once the paperwork's validated, received, and make sure that everything is there, the pharmacy um, has a process called a benefits investigation. And basically what that is, is they um, communicate with your health plan to see how a medication um, would be covered and if anything else is required. And if there's, if there's any challenges in the process, I know sometimes there's something called a, a prior authorization and, and sometimes things can get denied. So do you want to help us like understand this is a, a 201 level for all of us? So maybe help us understand what happens there. Sure. So um, if in case anyone's not sure what the terminology, um, I want to be inclusive to make sure. I know some of you probably already know this, but a prior authorization is basically a request from your provider to ask if there is... Um, uh, an approval for you to receive that medication. Um, and so paperwork is also done during that process and it has to be sent back and forth between your provider and the health plan. Sometimes there are um, denials, but depending on the health plan, there's different levels called an appeal where you can request to be reassessed that decision. Okay, okay, so there's options for people. Yeah. Um, so for folks in this room who might have had some challenges maybe accessing a medication or, or have heard from some of their friends, um, can you help us understand like what how people can play a role in this process? It sounds like there's a lot that's happening with these companies. How can, how can individuals play a role here? Sure, yeah, I think that um, one, I will always say this to people from my experience, is if this is something that you are involved with, if you and your provider have decided that there's a medication that's right for you, save phone numbers in your phone because sometimes calls will need to happen where you need to answer to either answer a question or there's missing information they need to verify. So I always recommend that phone numbers um, get put in the phone, your phone. And I would say that's probably your job is the biggest is to just be there for when questions need to be answered regarding your case. Um, but also, um, if, if you want to check to see where things are, call the specialty pharmacy, call your provider and um, kind of see, like, you can ask where it is in that process. It does sound kind of simple, but I don't know about you. I don't like getting phone calls from phone numbers I don't recognize. <laughs> I don't either. <laughs> so does that, is that the hardest part, you think? Yeah, yeah, I think so, because, um, you know, oftentimes they could be coming from numbers that you may not recognize. I know I'm like not great. Sorry, I just hit my microphone. I'm not great at um, answering phone calls either when I don't recognize the number because we do get those types of calls. But I would say um, talk with your provider, put their number in their, your phone, put a specialty pharmacy who you know you'll be getting a call from in your phone. And, and that's a really great way for you to know that, that someone you should be answering the call is coming to you. Yeah. And sometimes specialty pharmacies might have different numbers um, with different services that are provided. Mm -hmm. Do you want to maybe give a few examples? And again, this is very general, but things that a specialty pharmacy can provide? Sure, yeah. So pharmacies, specialty pharmacies sometimes will provide an additional level of education or counseling um, to you as the patient. So this may be offered either through a pharmacist or even a nurse there. So sometimes um, the number you get from them may look different, but um, they do have individuals who are a great resource at the specialty pharmacy for you to reach out to and talk to and can answer some of your questions. Awesome, awesome. Thanks for walking us through this process. Sure, absolutely. I think there is a lot that we, we didn't talk through about like benefits verification and insurance coverage. And this is why we have Abby here with us today. And we're gonna really bust some myths about affordability. So Abby, let's start with maybe, maybe a, a myth. 
So if a person hears that another person is taking a medication and it costs a certain amount, would it be a myth for that, for one to believe that they would pay the same price for that medication? Yeah, absolutely. So even I think of even within the same employer, it's possible the employees could have a different benefit. Um, employers often offer multiple options to choose from. So that's just one example where uh, even an employee working for the same company, you're going to have two different benefits, two different benefit designs, and possibly two different cost shares for your medication. Uh, so absolutely a myth, and it would vary patient to patient, person to person. It varies a lot. Yeah, yeah. Um, and some of those costs that patients pay, it could be co-insurance or co-pay. Do you want to maybe just give us the basics for those of us, a refresher on those definitions? Yeah, uh, so there is a lot of insurance lingo out there, and, and you guys may already be familiar with some of these, but the most common terminology you'll probably hear uh, copay, deductible, co-insurance, out-of-pocket maximum. So I, I won't go into too much detail, but give a high-level overview of what some of those things mean. So your copay is typically a set dollar amount. It typically wouldn't vary. It's what you would pay month to month for a particular medication. Uh, some medications are subject to deductible and out-of-pocket. Uh, deductible is what you'd pay before your insurance or your co-insurance would kick in. Uh, that would be a set dollar amount as well. Uh, co-insurance typically, so that's a shared cost between the insurer and the uh, benefit holder. Typically that's a 20-80 split, but it certainly can vary. Uh, and the last one is your out-of-pocket maximum. Um, so that is required to be satisfied before the insurance plan would typically pick up at 100%. So if I'm hearing correctly, um, deductible and those types of things, out-of-pocket maximum could depend and differ by the year. Oh yeah, uh, that, that's a really good point. So a lot of benefits will renew at the first of the year and be on a calendar year design, but it is possible that some plans renew at a midpoint during the year. Uh, the most, the second common most benefit renewal would be July 1st. So I do think it's important to understand your benefit structure and when your benefit renews, uh, which basically means your deductible, your out-of-pocket, all of those are going to be resetting again. And the most common, again, is that one one date, but it's also possible to happen at any other point in the year. And that's a really interesting thing to bring up too. And, and um, knowing that is important because if you are on a specialty medication, if you do know that there's a change in your insurance or if you're having a plan change mid-year, the beginning of the year, to notify that provider um, and your specialty pharmacy that you are having that change in case there is something like the prior authorization that we talked about earlier. If you need that again, they can they can move on that as soon as they know what, what your plan is. Yeah. Good point. It's another, it's another good point and a tip to kind of stay organized to make sure that you're informing all the different parties of any changes. Mm -hmm. um, so Abby, if people have questions about their insurance plan, are there additional resources beyond contacting their insurance company? Yeah, yeah. The insurance company, seem, that would be the logical first step, but I would also encourage if you have questions about your plan design, benefit structure, what drug is covered, uh, to reach out to your uh, human resources department with your employer. I also think the specialty pharmacy who's filling that medication is also a really good resource. Uh, additionally, the manufacturer may be an option as well to help explore uh, what the coverage and benefit design looks like. Yeah. And I know you mentioned talking about your HR department, um, and I think many people get their insurance through their employer, but there are other ways to get insurance. So do you want to provide a little bit of an overview of that? Yeah, yeah. So there, um, when we talk about employer-sponsored health benefit, we typically refer to that as commercial coverage, but there are other ways to access insurance. Um, the health insurance exchange, uh, and also government-sponsored insurance programs, most common ones being Medicare, Medicaid, uh, TRICARE. Uh, VA benefits, and that could impact some of the some of the, the support programs and resources that are available for people, right? Yeah, yeah. So a lot of manufacturers offer a variety of patient support um, services, and uh, depending on what type of insurance coverage you have, whether that's commercial or a government-sponsored plan, uh, it may dictate which of those programs you may be eligible for. Um, but all of those questions too could be answered um, by your specialty pharmacy or even referencing the manufacturer webpage. 
That's helpful. Okay. Um, for someone who's starting a new medication, um, are there any specific resources intended for them in that in that starting off period? Yeah. Oh, that's a really. So, are there um, resources that could help you get started on a medication? And uh, what comes to mind is uh, we know that it's possible to have an insurance related delay when you're prescribed a new medication because of what Kristen mentioned, and maybe the drug requires a prior authorization, which may take some time. Um, it's not uncommon for manufacturers of specialty medications to offer. They may be called voucher programs, may be called quick start programs, uh, but it's a temporary offer to allow access to a product while the insurance uh, benefit is being established. And it's typically for a set time period, maybe 15 or 30 days. And again, that's a voucher offering to allow access to get started while that prior authorization or PA is, is in the works. Yeah, yeah. And I'm thinking back to the person um, who, who spoke at the Illuminate Hypersomnia event. Um, who said that they were nervous about keeping, um, being able to stay on their medication through insurance or job changes. Is there any support for those situations? Yeah, uh, a lot of manufacturers do also offer, the, the names may vary, but a temporary program or a bridge benefit. Um, I think the example is great. So maybe I change employers partway through the year and now my new employer needs a prior authorization for my medication. I'm already active. I'm already established on this drug. Uh, so manufacturers will offer that bridge benefit to make sure a patient doesn't lapse in therapy while they're working on the new PA with that new employer. Um, other scenarios would apply there as well, but it's a benefit that would allow for continued access to therapy that's already been started. Yeah, yeah. It sounds like there's a lot of different resources available that are customized on somebody's experience. Would you say that? Oh, yeah. Um, I, I think the best place to go to understand those resources a little bit better, too, um, the manufacturer's webpage, talking to your specialty pharmacy to know what's out there and look at some of the eligibility criteria that is publicly available. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, let's try to bust another myth. So if someone is, is not eligible for one program, it means that they won't be eligible for another program. Is that a myth, Abby? Yeah, the, the programs, they, they would vary. Um, and I think manufacturers look to see what could provide the most support to patients taking their products. And there are different programs for different um, groups. So depending on the eligibility criteria, I, I would keep looking at what's available. And again, use your specialty pharmacy as a resource, use those of it publicly available manufacturer websites to see what options may be a good fit for you in that specific situation. Yeah. And if you're not sure if you're eligible, is there any harm in applying for any of those programs? No, I, there's really no harm. Um, I would say if you're, you're not clear if you're eligible for a voucher benefit or what we talked about with the bridge benefit, um, there certainly is no harm in asking or applying. Um, and that would also get the ball rolling to have a conversation with your specialty pharmacy team uh, to help support you to the best access route. Yeah, yeah. That's great. Thanks for sharing. Mm -hmm. Let's talk a little bit about um, advocating for yourself, if that's okay. Yeah. Um, so I think we've talked through a lot of tips around specialty pharmacies, but for those of you who may not be engaging with a specialty pharmacy, are there any like quick tips here that even folks in this room can do, you know, between now and the next session? Sure, absolutely. Um, I've, I've said this before, but it's really coming from experience that I've seen with, with patients when they um, are, whether it's a new diagnosis, which is overwhelming just to have that, and then going through the process of getting a medication that should hopefully um, make you feel better um, is save those phone numbers, um, keep a copy of your, your, your card, write down questions, like even as they come to you, just over time, that way you have them to ask when you're, when you're ready to ask them. And if you can, um, bring someone with you to support. I think individuals here may have brought someone with them to, to support them, get the answers. I would say that that's huge because we know that um, providers sometimes don't have a lot of time during visits. Um, and so it's helpful when you're receiving a ton of information to have another person there with you to, to support you along the way. 
I'd say too, don't, don't be afraid to reach out to seek for answers on your own benefit and your own coverage for a particular medication. Um, don't be afraid to talk to your human resources department, get clarity. If a drug isn't covered, why isn't it covered? And try to understand that a little more deeply. Um, from a specialty pharmacy standpoint, Kristen touched on this earlier, um, specialty pharmacies are unique uh, that they do have representatives that are trained in benefit investigation and verification that can help support your understanding too of um, what the prior authorization process may look like, what that access process looks like, and can direct you to the best resource to get that medication. And Kristen talked about maybe bringing somebody along to some of the appointments, but Abby, if, if folks are on the phone with their insurance company or on the phone with their specialty pharmacy, is there a way that they can kind of bring those parties together or have a friend listen in as well? Yeah, yeah. And I, I've seen this in some instances where um, being your own advocate and, and maybe there's a disconnect between the insurance and the specialty pharmacy. Um, one avenue you could consider exploring is getting your insurance on the phone with your specialty pharmacy, having that three-way call, that three-way connection to work through what that barrier to access may be um, and having all parties involved to help with that. Yeah, yeah. Now, sort of like thinking about like wrapping up, um, any words of advice for someone who's considering a new medication from an access perspective? Should they be worried about being able to, to afford it? I think there are a lot of resources out there. Um, uh, some manufacturers offer, uh, it's often called a copay assistance program or a coupon program uh, that can help paying for medication. So that is an avenue that also could be explored from a financial standpoint. Um, and I, I would again, um, put that question back to the specialty pharmacy because they do have resources at their disposal to share with uh, the patients that they support. Yeah. Kristen, any, any nuances of a specialty pharmacy that folks in this room should know maybe about like getting, getting their shipment or anything? Yeah. So um, most of the time um, with these pharmacies, if they're, they're sending over mail, it depends on the medication, of course. Um, sometimes you have to be home or somebody else has to represent you to be at your home to, to sign for these um, medications. So when you're having those conversations with the pharmacy, um, working with a plan that's best for you um, in order for you to get uh, the, the medication for you to receive it so that it's a time and day that works for you. Awesome. Any words of advice or any last tips, anything we haven't mentioned? Yeah, I, I really want to emphasize to know your resources. Um, I know that sometimes these processes seem overwhelming and, and stressful, but there's a lot of people who want to support and want to be there um, for you. So know where to go, whether that's the websites Abby's discussed, the, the nurses and providers, the doctors at your office. Um, if you are working with a specialty pharmacy, if you have questions about the medication, there's pharmacists there you can usually speak to. There's nurses often you can speak to. So really know your resources. I would say that's my, from experience in the past, um, knowing where patients can go to get answers and feel supported along the way is, is one of the biggest things I hope you can take away from this today. And I think too, it never hurts to ask. It never hurts to ask a question, to drill in, to understand your benefit, to understand um, uh, what's available to you. So I just encourage everybody ask those questions, challenge your specialty pharmacy uh, and, and help them support you in finding that path to access. Yeah, it does sound like a lot of work to be able to advocate for access to medication. Um, but I hope the team today shared um, some tips and tricks to, to work through the process and some definitions as well um, as you are as you are in the process. Um, I just want to um, follow up with one more slide for some for some resources. So everyone's familiar with the Hypersomnia Foundation. Their website has a page on insurance information, um, and that's a very nice resource for you to visit. Um, also, some of the definitions um, and many more definitions are available on a glossary on healthcare.gov. And while the U.S. insurance situation is very different from other countries, um, we would we would want to make sure that we we acknowledge Hypersomulans Australia, which helped make IH Awareness Day a, a global event along with all the other organizations here. So thank you so much. Thank you.